Kawhi lives in, in college back house. You know what I'm saying? Welcome to Speak for Yourself, Marcel Wiley. He's a manual Ocho. My dog. Don't bless me during a break. He tells me about, what's his name? Toby. We went rapper. Oh. Night job. Night. Oh, what you? All right, man. Let's get it started right here in L.A. with the Lakers. All that rap music. Vulgar. Who finished their season with a win over the Pelicans last night. The good news, LeBron played his second consecutive game for the Lakers, scoring 25 points in 27 minutes. Beast. Bad news, LeBron and Anthony Davis both tweaked an ankle. And the scoring champ Steph Curry and his Warriors are coming to town for the 7 8 playing game Wednesday. So, Acho, how concerned should Lakers be right now? Uh, Lakers have to be fairly concerned, Sell. The only mm. time as a Lakers fan I would be more concerned if there was a 7 following the game, you okay. feel me? Game yeah. 7, yeah. or if there was a Larry O'Brien trophy painted on the court. Mm. Those mm. are the only two times I think the Lakers should be more concerned than they should be right now. Everybody looks at the Warriors and they're like, yeah, they were a good team. It's a good story. It's cute. Great. But the Warriors are the best team over the last month of basketball in the Western Conference. It's not about who you're facing in totality. Who are you facing that day? You know this, big dog, and we talk uh, about this in sports all the time. You do not have to be the best team in the league. Nope. You just got to be the best team on the court or on the field that day. Say it. The Warriors have proven time after time, six games straight, but have proven since April 10th, they are more often than not the best team on the court that day. They ain't got to be the best team in the league. Ooh. They just got to be the best team out of the two teams on the court. And so that reason the Lakers should be concerned. Mm. The other primary reason the Lakers should be concerned is LeBron James has left two out of the last three games he started. Huh. So there's a good likelihood that even if LeBron James starts, he probably going to get hurt over the course of the game. Now, 75% LeBron is still probably better than the majority of basketball players in the NBA. <laughs> but 75% LeBron isn't King James. 75% LeBron is just LeBron James. Jack James. <laughs> Something, but that ain't, ain't the king. All right. And so when I look at it, the, the two primary reasons I'm concerned out the gate is, number one, Steph Curry and the Warriors are in their bag, and they are the best team in the NBA since April 10th. So I don't care about who's been the best since December 25th. That mm. don't matter no more. Mm. Who's been the best as of late? That's the first thing. And second thing is, yeah, LeBron James is amazing, but LeBron James starts and does not finish games due to that ankle. Those two reasons are huge causes for concern. Nah, man, you ain't going to come up here and try and reverse troll me and, and bait me into saying all the Lakers need to be concerned when you're just faking it. Lakers don't need to be concerned about this situation. Um, there's so many ways to attack this. Let me start here. Uh, you gave me an April 10th till present day yes, sir. statistic, right? Yes, sir, I did. You want to go April 9th, April 8th? You go <laughs> any other days in April you want to talk about with these Golden State Warriors? Uh, I remind you that the Lakers don't have to start fast to finish strong. Last year, they went to the bubble. Remember, everyone was saying, oh, the sky is falling. They went three and five going into mm -hmm. the playoffs. What happened in the playoffs? 4-1, 4-1, 4-1. <laughs> and 4-2. <four> <laughs> like, come on, stop playing. So I'm not going to buy into that. This is the championship team with championship moxie. They will know how to fix themselves at the appropriate time. That said, um, you got to be aware of danger, mm -hmm. but not beware of danger. There's a difference. Aware of... Give me that. I hate okay. when you do this. Okay, okay. I hate go. when you drop okay. a bar like okay. it's nothing. Oh, okay. It's Monday. <laughs> Let me hear this bar. All right, Toby, not wait with it. We <laughs> win. Yeah, I'm him. Um, <laughs> aware of danger, but not beware of danger. The best example I got is you running through the streets during the pandemic. Like, you were aware there was an issue going on, right? I told I saw an <laughs> Instagram story. It goes away for a day, but... Uh, um, but you were beware of danger like there are obstacles out there the whole well we got to respect every opponent and every opponent has the opportunity to take us out we get all that that's aware of danger mm -hmm. respect but fear scared should the lakers be concerned absolutely not this is the championship team when they go big out there when anthony davis says okay small ball to them is anthony davis playing the five good lord what are the Golden State Warriors going to do? You always got to be aware of Steph Curry. As soon as he pulls into the parking lot in the team bus, he's going to shoot. And we understand that that shooting ability won't be compromised even against the Lakers. That said, the Lakers, with their championship pedigree, with the fact that their guys haven't been together, the positive side of that is maybe a fresher unit than usual. This team is going to be ready when needed, and that's coming up soon. The kicker is, we've been saying this for a while, Sale, and yeah, I have. Well. The Lakers are going to fix themselves at the appropriate time. You said this team will be ready when needed. Playoffs. It's here. 
The appropriate time what? is no longer like, ah, uh, Lakers going to be ready in a month two or two. Two games before the play-in is the appropriate the, the, time? The, the, appropriate, the appropriate time is now, the play-in. Like, we're here now, okay, big we're dog. Here. Not today, so, Wednesday. I don't, I don't think that they, they haven't proven themselves to be ready. I love what you said about oh. be aware of danger, but you don't need to beware of danger. Mm -hmm. But here's the kicker. The only way I can be aware of danger and not beware of danger is if I have the appropriate artillery to fend off the danger. Ooh, I'm what do I mean? Mm -hmm. Say me and you was hiking somewhere out in the, in, in a, in a canyon, Runyon Canyon or something, okay. and all of a sudden we see a mountain lion. Now, why? <laughs> yeah, <go> that far. <laughs> if we see a mountain lion, run. We do no. Don't run. Don't run. They say back up. They say back up. Who's they say they? the dead people. <laughs> the they say they? back up. What? They say don't break eye contact with the mountain oh, yeah, lion. Hey, that's what you're supposed to do. Supposed to bend down. Pick up a rock. You're not supposed to bend over at the hunch. Supposed to bend your knees, pick up a rock, and throw it at said mountain lion. I've researched just in case they ever come face to face with I'm, a mountain I'm going lion. hiking with you more, though. I'll keep talking. But here's the kicker, Sal. What? What you gonna do if they ain't no rocks? <laughs> what you gonna do if you ain't got the proper artillery to fend off the mountain lion? Uh. And my concern is that the Lakers do not have the proper artillery to fend off Steph Curry. Right. So they can be aware of Steph Curry and not beware of Steph Curry, assuming they have the proper artillery. Mm. If we have uh, uh, rocks at our disposal, see the mountain lion? I'm not tripping mm. because I have what I need to fend off the attacker. Mm. But the Lakers have a hobbled LeBron James. I don't know what that can do to Steph Curry. The Lakers have an Anthony Davis, who we know he comes and he goes like the wind. I mean, is he healthy? Is he not? Yeah, he the Lakers out. don't have the artillery necessary to fend off the opponent, which is the Warriors, at least not consistently. So mm. I like the wordplay. You know me. I try to be a wordsmith. Be aware, but don't beware. I like the wordplay. But I think it only works if you have the necessary artillery. And a hobbled LeBron James is at best questionable artillery when it comes to defeating said Warriors. Okay, hold on. All right. You don't need a rock all the time. I mean, that's the literal definition and whatever you saw on Google, your shoe will work. Eddie Murphy mama, <laughs> my shoe. She hit him with the shoe. Something will work. You ain't. You don't need a rock. And I ain't looking at no mountain lion. I don't give a damn what they said. Mountain lion's gonna You're look running. back. I'm out. Like, what else am I going to do? I'm just going to sit there and get sliced up. I'm going to be running. It's good luck. Me against you. I'm faster than DK Metcalf. I'll get out. <laughs> um, here's the thing. You forget that in this moment right now, despite LeBron being in and out the lineup, despite AD in and out the lineup, the Lakers ended the season, what, a five-game winning streak? Yes, sir. When the last time the Lakers had a five-game winning streak or longer? You got to go back to January, early February. So the point is, there was some clarity. There was some mental focus. There was some application of this team's resources, the rocks in the locker room, and they found a way to finish strong according to what they had in terms of talent. Now, this wasn't the best version of the Lakers we've seen all year, but it was still a strong finish, and that's all you got to do. Come into this postseason, <clears throat> excuse me, play-in tournament, because <laughs> it's not the postseason just yet. If you lose two games, you're not in the postseason. Go into the play-in tournament, was some kind of positive momentum for those who need it. But for LeBron James and now the champion Anthony Davis, I don't see those guys as like, yeah, we need to make sure that we are feeling good and that we have our proper energy and let's go beat the Golden State Warriors. They don't need that Rudy speech. They're just going to look across, see the other team and say, Steph Curry, we cancel him. What the rest of that team going to do? But here's the kicker, Sal. Because so I was having this debate in the dress room prior to the show. We say it so flippantly. Mm. Steph Curry, we cancel him. What are they going to do? Uh, Steph Curry is only 6'3". What are they going to People have been trying to cancel Steph Curry. Oh, I'm not saying he's going to go away. I'm saying we can neutralize him. Whatever his point's going to be. Give him 45. What, the, what else you going to do? And, 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 here's, my, here's the fear, and here's why the what Lakers do? have to be concerned. Steph Curry is going to be the best player on the court. Why? Because LeBron James is not 100% healthy. Why? Because Anthony Davis is not 100% healthy. Okay. So in a play-in game, which is sudden death. Well, you get you got to Okay. You, yeah, yeah, the Lakers yeah, get two. Yeah, but yeah. In, the, in the one with the Warriors, no, which is a sudden saying. death one. Facts. Who going to be the best player on the court? At the end of the day, it's almost like if you got the big joker, mm. if you have the, mm. the trump card, mm. if you have the draw four, if you could only have one card remaining, give me the high card. Mm -hmm. And Steph Curry is the high card. Now, yes, we could look at the rest of the hand, and we could say, ah, let's look at the... But if we play in a game and it's a hey, big dog, whoever wins this last game going to take it all. Give me the draw for it. Give me the big joker. Give me the Trump. Take the Trump card. Mm. And Steph Curry is the Trump card. If I'm looking at it, you bring up a phenomenal point. The Lakers have won five straight. 
The Warriors have won six straight. Lakers are 10 and 10 since April 10th. Warriors are 15 and 5. We live track. We're going to talk track. We love tracks. So let's talk track. Let's go. And I don't care about who started the season with the fastest PR. Mm. Who's running the best right now? Yeah, yeah. You know that, big Tune dog. If, if somebody mm -hmm. out here, oh, man, they ran a 9-9 a nine, nine back in April. Too early. What did they run in June? Yeah, yeah, too what early. What did they run in July? Right. That's what you got to worry about. And as it looks right now, the Warriors are in a dead sprint hitting their stride. Do I still think the Lakers are going to win? Yes, because oh, I'm a biased okay. Lakers fan. And I'm a LeBron James fan. But you have to be concerned because Steph Curry could drop 46 like he did last night. He could drop 49 like he did a week ago. He could drop 30 points like he's done, what, 35, 40 times this mm -hmm. season. Mm -hmm. And now what? And no one's ever lost a game with the other team just having 30 points. Because, I mean, Anthony Davis and the rest of these guys, stop it. How many times have you lost to Uno holding a draw for? I know I have. I'm sitting there like, Damn! Like, oh, somebody beat you out with Bluetooth, green two. You're like, what the hell? You're like, I got this draw four. Wait, man, that's gonna be Steph Curry. Bluetooth, green two. Green two. Steph Curry. Two. Uno, Uno. They hit you with that. And everybody yelling Uno. It's not about yelling Uno first, y'all. Read the rules. Anyway, so Steph Curry gonna be sitting there like, I got to draw four, and they're like, so what? We just gonna cancel you out with the Anthony Davises of the Lakers in that world. Let me give you this, because you said you're a Lakers fan by bias. Yes, sir. Take the bias away and be an analyst. Okay. Who would you rather be? I always bring up this example because we can have fodder. Let's go here. All my dog. Day. My you dog. You go to the barbershop. I do not because I do not like to spend three hours arguing about something that we all know the answer to. So who would you rather be? Golden State Warriors or Los Angeles Lakers? Thank you. So we just had 15 minutes of argument, but really, you want to get your cut, hair are, cut like me. Are you sure? If, if you sure? know this, if, if you Steph Curry right now and you like, yo, I just dropped 46. We beat the number one seed, the Utah Jazz. We beat the Phoenix Suns, the number two seed. We just beat Memphis, who's about to be another playing team. I just hit two critical threes at the end of the game. We're 15 and four when I make seven plus three pointers. So really, the success mm. of this team is dependent on the success of me. Do you really think Steph Curry would rather be the Lakers? Because he probably looking his chops right now. Oh, LeBron James left injured? Oh, you know AD ain't like, who gonna check me, Caruso? <laughs> Caruso gonna check He's me? He's the best option. If but you I hear say you. who would you rather be, it's so easy for us to say the Lakers. And in all honesty, we should. I'm about uh, to any, say, any easy. Any betting man should say the Lakers. But I think it'd almost be like, it's because we're going like water. We're taking the easiest route. Path of least and, resistance? Yes. Okay. And the path of least resistance says, take the Lakers, LeBron James, AD, take the Lakers. Are we just going to ignore the Warriors being 15 and 5? Are we ignoring Steph Curry dropping 46? Are we ignoring Steph Curry being the scoring champion, averaging 32 points a game? Are we just going to ignore all of those things to take the Lakers? No, we're going to actually acknowledge that the Lakers, three-point line, fourth best defense this year, despite all those injuries. We're going to acknowledge Lakers, second best scoring defense, despite all those injuries. So... We know they're going to have a tremendous offense. At least one guy is going to go out there and get his buckets in Steph Curry. But as a collective, would you rather be a finger or a fist? Thank you. Like, good luck. Back, back, back. That's how it's going to be. But play. the question is this, and this is why I love doing the show with you. Let's go. Are some of the fingers in the fist broken? <laughs> <laughs> I done broke my thumb before, big dog. Me too. I, I, <laughs> <stage. Why laughs> Y'all get that shot of my dog's finger. <laughs> what are you doing? I ain't banging right now. This is just how it looks. <laughs> I broke my thumb before in football practice, and I had to finish the practice mm. with a broken thumb. And not one of those like, oh, yeah, you no, 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 no. The joint was broke, yeah. like hot to the touch. Yeah. I didn't know it was broke, so I just said put some tape on it. So when you have a broken thumb, as you probably know, it hurts just to catch. Yeah. It, it, it hurts yeah. just to touch. Oh. It, it, it hurts just to shake. So, yes, in theory, I would rather be a fist over a finger. But let one of these fingers in this fist be broken. Mm. LeBron James. Yeah. Let one of these yeah. fingers in this fist be broken. Anthony Davis. That'll hurt a broken finger. Oh. This right here is going to hurt a broken finger. Don't get it twisted now. No. Steph Curry might mess around mm. and hurt one of these fingers in this yeah. fist. Way to choke me with my own point. It was pretty good when it came out. <laughs> it, it feels so good when it came back to me. You know what the worst thing about this? Before we go. Um, a broken finger doesn't cross the threshold where coaches are sympathetic for you. It's like, I, the worst injuries, people don't understand. The worst injuries are when coach looks at you like, that's it. And you're like, no, this is everything. This is the most painful thing I ever did. Broke my finger, too, as well. Didn't want to touch a soul, a soul. out there. A soul. Didn't want anyone even say hi, Marcells. I didn't want you to wave your hand, let alone touch my hand. But still, you got to go out there and play injured. I'd rather play injured as the Lakers than be full at strength like the Warriors. We'll see how they battle coming up. Coming up, the champ is here. What? He's in the building?
We'll find out what's next for UFC welterweight champion. Say his name. Kamaru Usman. Oh, I can't say it like that. But first, Packers coach Matt LaFleur. You can't say that. <laughs> the Packers <laughs> want Aaron Rodgers back in the worst way. Uh... We'll tell you Rodgers and how you should feel about that next on Speak for Yourself. Aaron Rodgers' standoff with the Packers appears to remain unchanged. Rodgers hasn't wavered from his demand to be traded. And the Packers, they're standing firm as they want to keep the reigning NFL MVP. Now, Green Bay head coach Matt LaFleur shared his thoughts on the situation. Y'all take a listen. I've got nothing new to, to update, and uh, we still obviously feel the same way. It's, uh, you know, we want him back in the worst way. I know he knows that, and, um, you know, we'll, we'll continue to work at it each and every day. Mm. So, Sal, how should Aaron Rodgers feel about Matt LaFleur's comments? We want him back in the worst way. Mm. Man, this is a bad place this organization <laughs> is in right now. Talk about tucking your tail. This is, if I'm Aaron Rodgers right now, I'm sitting there, and I literally will go on what Pat McAfee's uh -huh. show, and I say, I told them not to funk with me, and they funked with me. So, Aaron Rodgers was a kitten in the corner. And everybody thought, oh, it's all sweet. It's all cute. We can go draft Jordan Love. We don't got to get receivers. We ain't got to go get personnel to help him out. He's, you know, it's Aaron Rodgers. He's a part of us. We help build him into who he is. You ever get a kitten in the corner? They look sweet. They ain't sweet. They coming out that corner fighting. And Aaron Rodgers came out that corner fighting. Not only as an MVP last year, not only as another year taking this team to the NFC Championship game, but now he's like, you can't buy my love back. Mm. And that's the toughest thing. Anybody who's ever been in a relationship knows this. Money and gifts feels amazing. Oh, who doesn't like that? Who doesn't like to receive it? And me, I even like to give it to my wife, make her feel good. But there's one thing that trumps all of that, money and gifts. Just treat them right. Like everyday simple treatment is better than you trying to give me this splash effect of trying to make up for your issues. So when I look at this situation, it's just funny to watch Matt LaFleur right there uh, try to come out of this with some makeup text. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> hey, bro, it works sometimes. <laughs> it ain't going to work in this situation if I'm Aaron Rodgers. I look at it and I just say, why did you even get to this place? There's so many different directions you guys could have pulled together and made this work. But you wanted to go in a different direction. Malafour bet on something else, and it didn't come to fruition. Mm -hmm. Like, let's just be real. The egg is in his face right now. So now, instead of him being contrite in a pure way, his contrition comes off as desperation. Like, oh, I don't have any other options. How you doing? And Aaron Rodgers is no fool. Not only one of the best players we have in this game, but also one of the smartest out there. Aaron Rodgers got him in the corner. Unfortunately, this kid ain't playing nice. Ooh, phenomenal take. Snaps. Oh, oh, Love Jones. Snaps. Love Jones. Phenomenal we here. We here. We here. I ain't got nothing to say. I'm going to just add to it. Um, Aaron Rodgers should feel amazing about the sentiments. We want him in the worst way. Because, Sal, uh, we've all also been in these situations and relationships when you know they did you wrong. Mm. You know they trying to come back. Mm. And so you got their number. It's just a matter of when are you going to forgive them, if at all. Yeah. You may not forgive them, and you might just sit there and let them beg. We want you back in the worst way. Come on, Matt LaFleur. <laughs> you should be ashamed of yourself. You sound desperate. Brian Gunku's Facts. GM. Facts. Jordan Love has a long way to go. Hey, bruh, <laughs> you can't go out with somebody else and be like, I never really loved them. It was always you. Mm. Please come back to me. Mm. That's what the Packers sound like. Mm. They sound desperate. Aaron Rodgers <laughs> should just sit there smiling, grinning. Because what it is, though, Sal, for me, as it stands to Aaron Rodgers, he don't want you to butter him up. He don't need the butter. Mm. He wants the cheddar. Mm. <laughs> you feel me? He don't need the butter. He just wants the cheddar. And he doesn't want the money for money's sake. Right. He doesn't want the money from the Green Bay Packers just to be more high paid than Patrick Mahomes or Deshaun Watson or Dak Prescott. But in the NFL, money has a direct correlation to commitment. Yeah. I don't care what you tell me. I need you to show me. I need the Packers to give Aaron Rodgers an outward expression of their inward love. What? <laughs> Let's go somewhere, y'all. We already there, bro. I need them to give Aaron Rodgers an outward expression of their inward love. So you can tell somebody, oh, I love you so much, oh. sweetheart. I love you. I want to spend the rest of my life with oh. you. I love you. I love you. Until you put a ring on that finger, there oh. is no true commitment. Because mm. at least once you put a ring on that finger and sign a marriage certificate, to break up is a much more lengthy process. Say now it. it's no longer a breakup. Now it's a divorce. Say it. 
Aaron Rodgers, these Packers could, oh, we want him in the worst way. Jordan Damn. Love has so far to go. Damn. But until there is an outward expression, new contract, guaranteed money, of the inward commitment, we want Aaron Rodgers in the worst way, then their words mean nothing. And Aaron Rodgers reads through them just like you and I do. Mm. Damn. <laughs> you know what's so crazy about this? Did, all right, hold on. Forget all this outward love and inner affection. Did you watch Baby Boy? See, you ain't that busy. I was busy this weekend. Oh, you I told you I was doing a shoot. Yeah, but you flew first class, if not private, to the shoot and back. You had 6, 12, 18 I had hours. To prep. I had to you prep. You had to prep? Really? I had to prep. Okay, okay. On the way back, you had to prep? Oh, yeah, yeah. You slept. <laughs> Damn it. All right, I need you to watch Baby Boy. Because Melvin grabbed that boy and said, I told you not to mess with me. It was a scene in there. And that's Aaron Rodgers grabbing Matt LaFleur. I told you not to mess with me, boy. Smacking his head like this. When you watch Baby Boy, all this going to hit you in the face. Anyway, let me hit you with a Wileyism. Maybe you could Please. understand one of these. I learned this over time because I've been quite ignorant in my days. Whatever you think of me in terms of wisdom right now, just make sure you understand that I used to balance that out with ignorance, okay? <laughs> <laughs> like, I actually improved on my design. I self-corrected a little bit. And I noticed that ignorance apologizes by improving. That's what an ignorant person will do. You, I don't want to hear it. When someone messes up, when I mess up, nobody trying to hear how sorry you are. We wanted mm. to just see you do better. Ignorance apologizes by improving. Now, your ignorant butts up there in this Green Bay organization, how did y'all improve on our relationship? How did y'all improve with our personnel? How did y'all improve in terms of weapons? How did y'all improve this offseason? Looks like another Green Bay offseason, but some begging at the end. That's not how, it do how it's done. They offer him a new contract and then act like that's going to just move it all over. Are we just going to make you the highest pay? They're like, first of all, I should be the highest mm -hmm. paid, so that's not doing anything for me. Oh, I'm supposed to be the highest paid, and now you're going to make me that? Like, show me improvement on that. And that's when you get into the details. And the details of the Green Bay Packers and their relationship of late with Aaron Rodgers doesn't suggest anything about love, doesn't suggest anything about they need him or want him in the worst way. Sal, so I heard this coming into the show. I heard this coming into the show. It's not you don't know what you got until it's gone. It's you don't know what you got until you're grown. <laughs> okay. I heard that. I heard okay. that. And that's applicable I'm now because I'm facts. the Packers, Matt LaFleur, management, Guttenkos, et cetera, Ugh. they had, they had to grow. Mm. But the kicker is this. I don't think they're going to grow until Aaron Rodgers is gone. Mm. That's the kicker. Because mm. you hit the nail on the head when you said they're doing the same things, just adding sorry at the end. <laughs> <laughs> like, what that mean? They're doing the exact same. Damn. Look like the same offseason. Oh. Looks like the same type of draft. Looks like the same uh, minimal help and aid for Aaron Rodgers. Back. Now they just said, but well, we love you at the end. That's it. Bro, don't tell. That, that is a sign of an abusive relationship. <laughs> you do whatever you want to do, but you end it with, I love you. Yeah. And you hope that I love you trumps all the actions that you did. Yeah. Aaron Rodgers not playing those games anymore. So now the question is really just simple. What would it take to keep Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay? Whew. And I think there's only one thing. It has to be an action. It has to be a, a, a guaranteed, probably a three-year guaranteed deal that shows Aaron Rodgers, A, we're financially committed to you. Thus, it doesn't matter what we tell you because we are financially committed to you. Jordan Love has to sit on the bench because we're paying you upwards of $105, $110 million over the next three years, roughly $38 million a year or so over the next three years. And it doesn't matter what we say anymore. You are our quarterback. That's the only thing, that's the only way I think they can remedy this situation because the, uh, the I miss you text, mm. the uh, uh, we want you back in the worst way, the oh. Jordan Love's not ready, <laughs> that don't do nothing but give Rodgers more ammo. Thank you. If I'm Aaron Rodgers, I am Aaron Rodgers. First of all, I can't even understand how his ego must feel. My ego is ginormous. I, I, I'm, I'm amazed it stays in my body. Like, it's pop, pop, pop. And that's just me. Aaron Rodgers? Like, literally, in my closet, it's called Sweat Taylor. I don't mm -hmm. know if you ever heard of it. The brand. Yeah, the brand. Aaron, Aaron, Sweat. Yes. Aaron Rodgers owns that. You know what I'm Yeah, yeah, yeah. That part. That's the point. I'm giving Aaron Rodgers money. Half my closet is him. So the <laughs> point, like, imagine if you Aaron Rodgers. People don't know how Aaron Rodgers touches so many different things. But anyway, if I'm Aaron Rodgers and I'm looking at the Green Bay Packers cheat on me like they did with Jordan Love, you think I'm going to let you move in your next in my house, your next girlfriend, your next relationship, your next quarterback in my house? And then this is the worst part. After that, you expect us to coincide. Like, 
both make breakfast for you. And, and <laughs> hey, man, there's not enough sorries in the world to excuse this type of behavior. Coming up, you need to say this. Welterweight champion Kamaru Usman is here. Or Gasa. We'll chat with the champ next. Speak for yourself. Oh, Welcome back to Speak for Yourself, the Nigerian edition. Our guest today is one of the baddest men on the planet, Kamaru Usman. He joins us fresh off his knockout victory or over Jorge Masvidal at UFC 261. The Nigerian nightmare, shout out Christian Okoye, is 19 and 1, undefeated in the UFC and currently riding an 18 fight win streak. Champ, mm. I salute you, Sai. Welcome uh... to the show. Thank you, thank you, our guy. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Let <laughs> Marcellus, me I just said thank you. Uh-huh. I said thank you. Yeah, you said our guy too, <laughs> and I'm gonna figure that out. Later. Oh God! Well, well hey, uh, we're gonna bring Marcellus in later in the show, but you repping a Nigerian yeah. shirt. I'm Nigerian, so we are gonna start there. Nigeria no de carry last. What does Absolutely. that mean to you? It means the world to me because growing up, I used to always hear that phrase, hear that saying all the time. And I never really knew what it meant until I got to the point where I was able to compete. Because it, it means at the end of the day, and it, and it ties into so many things now, it means at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter how, how, how much obstacles, how much pressure, or how many things are weighing us down. At the end of the day, we ain't going to be last. We still going to struggle. We going to fight for everything that we got. And we're never coming last place. And so that, that means the world to me when I, I get to say that because now I'm in the position to where I'm a symbol of hope mm. for my people. Mm. Uh, yeah. Marcellus, in layman's terms, always said, I know that Kari last. It's really just Nigerians. We're not going to finish in last place. Love but it. I got to stay on that, Sal, before I tag you in. Oh, yeah. Uh, my first email address, champ, was NigerianNightmare at Yahoo.com. Mm. See, every Nigerian that is good at something tries to claim the Nigerian Nightmare title but you actually hold the throne. Christian Okoye, he set the standard. Uh, Chiefs running back, you borrowed it from him. How do you feel having that nickname, the Nigerian Nightmare? I feel amazing. It, it was one of those things, one of those nicknames that you grow up, you hear, because every athlete that was at the tip top, at, at basically the elite athlete of Nigerian descent in their field, they wanted to claim that name because that name meant something to us. And growing up, I heard that name a few times and I said, man, I, I would love to do something one day to where I could bear that name. And as life has it, it just so happens that it comes full circle. And now I'm in a position to where I can really uphold that nickname and, and basically carry it on to the next generation. Of course, I grew up hearing about it with guys like Christian Nikoye, Samuel Peters, a WBC heavyweight boxing champion of the world at one point. And now I am just the next in line to basically be able to do justice to that name. <laughs> Much respect, man. Uh, just a little FYI to y'all. My 23 and me came back and um, got a lot of Nigerian in me as well. Uh, but look <laughs> we, at... We claim you. We claim you. Yeah, Uge. Uh, what'd you say before? Ugoa? <laughs> what? Oh, okay. I'm lost. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. I got it. Oh, God. I told you... It's been a That's while. That's a meme right there. That's gotta, a meme. Take me back. I got to go connect with my people. But I've been watching the UFC for a minute, and I am a huge fan of you, huge fan of the UFC. And one thing I've noticed is the African-born fighters mm. hold the heavyweight, mm-hmm. middleweight, mm-hmm. and welterweight titles it's in okay. the UFC. How much pride do you feel in that? Tremendous amount of pride because it's, it's very rare nowadays to be the first of something. Because, you know, as, as history repeats itself each and every time. And to, so to be the first to actually be able to do something and be a part of the first illustrious group to come through the UFC and have all champions, all from West Africa, uh, it, it's, it's a tremendous amount of pride that it gives me. Because when I was growing up, I never really got to see that example to say, I can do that one day. That's something that I aspire to do. So to be living it right now and to be, be that example for future generations to come, it, it means a tremendous amount to me. And I, I completely understand the responsibility that I have, and I don't take it for granted. You didn't even start watching UFC, if I'm not mistaken, until 05. Mm. Um, what is your advice to someone who wants to be great at something, even if they don't start until later in life? It's, there's, uh, as cliche as it sounds, there's no such thing as impossible. Mm-hmm. 
impossible is just a word that is placed on something until it, you make it possible. And, and that, that's kind of how it was. I, I never dreamt that I would be on this platform. I would be on this stage that I would be able to go in there and, and do what I do. I still don't think I can do what I do. <laughs> I still don't. I, I, I'm still afraid to go in there and compete each and every time that I step in there. But I know that I trust myself. I trust my training. And so by the time I step into that octagon, that's my domain. Mm. That's, I'm the king of that, that octagon. And I, and I wear it, and I, I definitely take full responsibility and, and full awareness of that. Now, athletes have to be humble, but at the same time, they have to be cocky. So you take me back to the moment you realized you were the baddest man on the planet. To be honest with you, I still don't realize it. Mm. I still don't know it. And I, I think that's, that's, that's what keeps me who I am. That's what keeps me excelling. Because there's a certain point that you get to, to where you start to basically, ah, I'm the best. So when you wake up in the morning and you feel a little extra story, it's easier to say, ah, well, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and just, I'm going to just chill today. I'm going to chill today because I'm already the best. Like, I'm going to chill. I'm going to take today off. No, I, I, I still look at it as I am a contender. I am that number one contender each and every time. And I have the opportunity to go out there and become champion. And I'm just grateful to be in this position in time to be able to showcase my skills and, and all the hard work that I put into this. Mm, you just took us into like the mindset to prepare. And as we all know, being athletes, preparation is the separation. So in our sport of football, we can go out there in full pads and we say it's full speed, but it's still practice. <laughs> How close do you get to in practice, the violence that you see actually when we're witnessing you in the octagon? Pretty close. Pretty close. I, 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 get, I, get, I would say about 80% because what we do in there, there's nothing that replicates that. Nothing. So when you're full speed, it, it's, it's very dangerous because anything can happen at any moment. So it's, it's almost tough to be able to replicate that. But when we're sparring, the gloves aren't the same size as, as you see us actually compete with. Because if, if you're doing that, then you're doing a lot of damage that it's unnecessary before you actually get to go in there and compete. And in most cases, something's hurt. You're dealing with something before you actually get to go in there. I don't think I've ever been in a fight to where I didn't have something that was bothering me or something that was wrong. But it's all a matter of preparation and persevering through because by the time I make it in there, nothing's going to stop me from showing the world all the hard work that I've put into this. Oh, no, I'm hyped. I'm hyped. <laughs> I'm hyped. I'm, I'm not going to fight nobody because I went to private school, but I'm hyped <laughs> right now. I am so hyped, too. Okay, we know you haven't been defeated, but what's been the closest to a defeating moment, whether it was a physical pain, mentally you were like, I'm just not in sync. What was that moment that you had to overcome to still be the great you are? I think in 2015, when I first made my, my UFC debut, um, I had a, a knee surgery in, I believe it was ending of March, and I had a, a micro fracture on my right mm. knee, which is, is not a surgery that you want to do nowadays. Doctors, I don't think, really do that, that as much anymore because it's such a, a, a big and traumatic injury. But I had that, and I think they say it's about an eight, month recovery process, but I had to compete for my team July 15th of that year. I think July 15th and being able to not have, you know, I basically was on one leg. I had to prepare and I prepared for that fight and I went out there and I won the fight for my team. Mm. Now, later that year, I wanted to fight again. And so now I started to see all of the, basically the wear and tear from not giving the appropriate time for recovery. I started to see it and I felt it. And there was a few times where I was walking into the house from the car from training and I barely, I couldn't walk into the house. I mm. could barely walk. And I remember one day I just sat outside on the grass and as hard as it is to say this, but I cried because I felt that my career hasn't even started yet and it's over mm. because I can't even walk. How am I ever going to get to that point of being champion one day? And then you get inside and you eat some food and you feel a little better about yourself and you go back the next day and some, you get to work. Some food, some goat meat, <laughs> some plantain, some pounded yams. Yes, um, jello fries, hey, all of them. Let me ask you this. <laughs> Have you ever been scared in the ring and when? Yes, I've always been, uh, I'm always scared. Always scared. Before every fight, I'm always scared. But just a little piece of, 
I guess, advice that I, I, I can give is you have to hone the fear. You have to control the fear because if you let the fear control you, you're out of your mind, you're out of your element. So everything that you did in preparation for that at a competition is lost. And so to be able to just hone all of that fear, when I step into that octagon, be able to use it, it's, I surprise myself each and every time when I, I'm done. I'm like, man, I really did that. That was me. I did that. I did that. Um, let me let me ask you this, because I don't care about the sports show right now. You're preaching to me. So I don't know if you preach to anybody else. You're preaching it. to me. You said you're scared, but what are you afraid of? I am afraid of disappointment. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of losing, losing in front of my family, losing in front of my friends. You've got, of course, you, nowadays, fans <laughs> have access to you. So losing in front of those fans, millions of fans all around the world, because they, they will make memes. That's what they do. They're going to do memes of you. And all of that is, is what scares me. Fear of disappointing my family because I let them down. If I go out there and I don't perform, then my daughter doesn't go to that private school. She might not make it to St. Mark's like you. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> all, 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 so all of that fear is what drives me because honestly, I, I've got to say the fear of failure to me is greater than the thrill of winning. Man. I love this dude. Um, let's talk about how those fans can get to you. And something that did get to you is the Jake Paul Media Madness Tour. Uh, when he called you out on Twitter, uh, I know you don't have any fear of these dudes, but what do you think <laughs> of Jake and Logan Paul and their place in the fight game right now? I think they, they, they definitely were smart to maximize their opportunity. As you see in the last year and a half, in the last two years, basically, we, we went to a, we got in, as a world, we got into a position to where we basically went through a global pandemic. People were locked inside the house. They couldn't get out. They couldn't do anything. And, and, what, and, and, and with all the hardships that the world was facing, the only thing that they truly wanted is to be entertained because that's something that could lift their spirits. And here comes the YouTubers. I mean, these guys <laughs> came in. These guys came in and definitely entertained the masses, entertained the world, even though it wasn't the best form of entertainment. They still gave us something. And so they gained a lot of popularity from it. But the one thing that does get me is entertainment is fine. I completely understand that. Entertain, more power to you. But when you start to disrespect the hard work that myself as an elite athlete or someone as someone like Floyd Mayweather as an elite athlete has put in to his preparation, that's where, you know, it doesn't sit well with me and to where we, I have to go out there. And if I have to, I would discipline Mm. Mm. Oh God! Just, just one, one final question. One mm. final question. That was that YouTube message with you too. The YouTube verse almost got you <laughs> off this show. Well, one, one final question: If you were to fight Jake Paul, how would it end? Oh God! First round, vicious, vicious, brutal KO. I mean, this is the type of KO that there would be memes made of this for a lifetime. Mm. <laughs> so, I would say just a brutal, vicious knockout. Oh, oh, my God. At least carry them for one round so we get our money's worth. <laughs> Good Lord, Uspad. Respect for you, man, so much. And thanks for joining us. Uh, I appreciate it, guys. Uh, appreciate Thank you so you, much. Bro. We'll, link, uh, we'll link off camera, man. Yeah, we all going to link. Course, my 23 and me. All of us. Oh, God, not on God. Oh, oh, God. Oh, God. It's just oh, God. That's why we got a link. Oh, God. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> Coming up, Tim Tebow is eyeing a second NFL journey, and some people are looking at him crazy for it. We'll tell you how we see it. That's next on Speak for Yourself. Speak for Yourself, Marcel Swati, Emmanuel, my I dog. Too. My dog. Oh, God. And let's head to Jacksonville, <laughs> a.k.a. Tebowville, where news of the Jaguars reportedly signing the former quarterback as a tight end rang out across the landscape. And many didn't like the sound. I was on vacation when the news first dropped, so I'm ready for this topic right now. And so is our friend Bucky Brooks, who wrote about it for NFL.com, saying, quote, I do not understand the outrage spawning from the Jacksonville Jaguars' interest in the former Heisman Trophy winner. While the situation is undeniably unique, with a 33-year-old attempting to transition from quarterback to tight end after an extended football layoff, I think the furor over Urban Meyer kicking the tires on one of his most decorated former players is over the top. The man behind those words, Fox Sports <laughs> NFL analyst Bucky Brooks, joins us. But Otto, let's start with you. You agree with Bucky that the Tim Tebow outrage is over the top? What I don't agree with is this, Bucky Brooks. You always throw one word in your article to make us struggle, to text our intellect. Furor? 
For a uh, fur? For, for, what did I even mean, Bucky? He did that for you, Seth. Fur. He was like, oh, Cell gonna have to read this one. Fur. Columbia gonna have to read this one. Fur. I said, well, I had to read the prompt. I'm like, fur? I'm like, did he mean fear? Anyway, Bucky, I'm done with you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With that being said, the outrage that Tim Tebow is getting is undeserved. The outrage that the Jaguars are getting is fully merited and fully deserved. Mm. Tim Tebow don't get, he, he, he deserves no indictment for working hard, for staying in shape, for being granted an opportunity, <laughs> for knowing a head coach. I'm not mad at him for that. I'm not mad at Tim Tebow for that at all. Okay. But I am frustrated with the Jacksonville Jaguars. And the reason I'm frustrated with the Jaguars is because I like to keep my takes <clears throat> even across the board. What do I mean? All offseason, we sat there and complained about the lack of opportunities for minority head coaches because nepotism and cronyism, hiring your friends and hiring your family, is causing black coaches opportunities because these white general managers and the white owners, remember the majority of general managers and owners are white, are hiring their friends. And we were all up in arms about that. So if we gonna be up in arms about the fact that head coaches and assistant coaches and general managers aren't getting opportunities due to nepotism, due to hiring of friends and hiring a family, then how am I gonna bat my eye when Tim Tebow is getting a job, when there are only 90, Tim Tebow's getting a job exclusively because he knows the head coach very well. If I didn't raise an issue with the other issue, then I wouldn't raise an issue with this one. Hmm. But the fact of the matter is, Tim Tebow is not getting that position because he is talented enough. The last time Tim Tebow was in the NFL was with me in 2015 <laughs> on the Philadelphia Eagles. I have been in media for five years now. That is the last time Tebow was in the league. Tim Tebow did not make the team at quarterback. Tim Tebow has never played tight end a day in his life. Mm -hmm. There are only 90 jobs. This might not mean anything to a second-round pick like Marcellus or a second-round pick like Bucky Books. But to the dudes that were six-round picks like myself, and you are scratching and clawing to make the roster, you are that 89th, that 90th, that 87th person, then it does matter. Because you done spent your whole life <clears throat> preparing for an opportunity, and it's going to go to a guy that's never, ever played the position. I don't care personally because I'm Gucci. I'm sitting on this desk right now, but I'm speaking about the overarching principle, which is what are the three categories <clears throat> that you need to be a good tight end? Y'all think about it real quick. Three categories that make somebody a good tight end. Okay, you probably came up with size, yeah. hands, speed. Tim Tebow does not have size. He is 6'2". He is my height. He does not have hands. He does not caught any passes in his NFL career, and I don't think in his college career. And he ran a 4.71 in his athletic prime over 10 years ago. He doesn't have size. He doesn't have hands. He doesn't have speed. The best tight ends in the game right now, George Kittle, 6.5, Darren Waller, 6.6, Rob Gronkowski, 6.7, Zach Ertz, 6.4 and some change, Eric Ebron, 6.5. Think of your favorite tight end, probably 6.5 and higher. Then you have Tim Tebow, 6.2. So he's clearly unqualified to play the position outside of knowing someone. And if we are going to be up in arms about other people that are lesser qualified, getting opportunities because of who they know, mm -hmm. I just have to raise the same issue right here. I understand why he got the job. I'm like this. He mm -hmm. sell, he'll sell a lot of tickets. I get that. One of the greatest college <clears throat> football players of all time. I get that. He was a beast at Florida. I get that. Jacksonville's in Florida. I get that. I'm not an idiot. I understand why <laughs> you would want him to sell tickets, but that doesn't undermine the truth of the matter. <sighs> I'm done. Okay, Acho, I get your frustration. And I think we all have sat in college with our coaches, and they say, look, it's not what you know, it's mm, who you know. Yes, sir. Mm. In fact, this weekend, I happened to be looking at TV, and I saw – Maybe a LinkedIn commercial with one Emmanuel Acho <laughs> where he gave somebody the plug where they got a job because of a connection, because that's what life is about. And so what I'm seeing, this is Tim Tebow has the plug. And what he did is he utilized his relationship with Urban Meyer to grant him an opportunity. It's one of the things that we all aspire to do, to have a wealth of contact that give us opportunity. And then with the opportunity, we take that and carry it over the goal line. And so I'm not upset about it because when I look up in New York this weekend, Kelvin Benjamin, who hasn't been in the league since 2018, was signed to be a tight end by the New York Giants. Why? Because Dave Gettleman drafted him with the Carolina Panthers. And so it's the hookup. It's the connection. That Lucky. leads to opportunities. 
I think about Alden Smith. Got me, yes. about Got me feeling like Kuzma right, right here, Bucky Brooks. For four or five years. <laughs> Alden Smith didn't play for four and a half years. Woo. He gets an opportunity to play for the Dallas Cowboys because of Jim Tom Sula. Mm. It's about the relationship. We see it all the time. When you know someone, they can bring you in, and what you do with it is on you. So mm. I, I don't understand the outrage. This is the most decorated player that ever played for Urban Meyer during his time at Florida. He won a Heisman Trophy. He won a national title with Urban Meyer. He is going to give his guy an opportunity. Now it's on Tim Tebow to make the most of it. It's one spot out of 90 spots on the team. I don't understand the fur over why he... Bucky got it. Real quick, real dang, quick. Dang, if, dang. If, if Tebow would have come back as a quarterback, I wouldn't have cared. Really? Because yes, because Tebow has at least shown us at some point in his life he has a proficiency to play the quarterback position. He hasn't shown it to us recently, but he's shown us at some point in life he can play the quarterback position at an incredibly efficient level. What do we say about tight ends necessities? You got to have size. You got to have speed. You have to have hands. Kelvin Benjamin, who you mentioned last, I checked, he was six five, two forty five. Check on size. Last I checked, he was a first-round pick at wide receiver uh, in 2014. Check on hands. Last I checked, uh, he was, I'm assuming, a 4-5, 4-6 combine guy. I don't have it here in front of me, but he was a first-round pick wide receiver, so he had to have been sub 4-7. So check on speed as it pertains to tight ends. Alden Smith got a job with the Cowboys after being out for five years. Last I checked, NFL record most sacks through the first two seasons of a career. If Tebow would have come back at quarterback and Urban Meyer would have said this, Marcellus, what? I'm going to use Tebow like I did when I won my first national championship at Florida. We'll get to the goal line. I'll use him for jump passes. I'll use him as a goal line QB. I'll use Trevor Lawrence like I used Chris Leak from the 20s to the 20s. Then I'll bring in Tebow. I would have said, huh, I don't think it'll work, but he's shown us he can play the quarterback position. But Tebow hasn't shown us he can play tight end, Bucky. Kelvin Benjamin has shown us at least he has the characteristics to play tight end. Alden Smith, we know he can play defensive and outside backer just about as good as anybody in the world has ever seen uh, before all the problems. So that is where there is a disconnect, Bucky. So many people raise hell. Well, what about Kelvin Benjamin? At least Kelvin Benjamin looks like George Kittle. At least he looks like Zach Ertz. At least he looks like Ron Cal. At least he looks the part. Tebow don't even get in the club based on looks alone. <clears throat> oh, my God. And looks are deceiving. Uh, <laughs> this take is going to take y'all everywhere, but let's start here. I remember being a San Diego Charger. You know me. I was that dude at the time. Mm -hmm. And then they lined up somebody against me who I was like, hey, what's your name, homeboy? I never heard of you. He was like, Antonio. Antonio who? Gates. Oh, okay. Well, where'd you go to school? Kent State. Okay. Uh, you played tight end? How I ain't hear about you. No, I ain't even play football. What? You ain't play football? You didn't even play football. You were a basketball player. Next thing I know, you're in the Hall of Fame. Acho, looks are deceiving. We know how you can learn and adapt in the NFL. Tim Tebow, let me get this straight. You are upset at him for coming. Not him. Not him. The Jags. Or, or the Jags. Yes, sir. For this guy accepting a different position, putting his hat in hand and saying, whatever you got, I will go out there and perform. And this is just kicking the tires. We're not saying he's guaranteed to be on the roster. We'll figure this out. Tim Tebow did play tight end before. People don't watch all of the football games like I do. For the Jets, he was an H-back. They threw a pass at him, hit him in the <laughs> head, and he realized, <laughs> you know what? Next time I'm in the NFL, I am going to catch that ball. All right, here it is. This is Tim Tebow. Hey, Call it what you want. My first play in the NFL, I think I got pancakes. Turned out I, been, I became an all-pro. Things can change. Here's the thing about Tim Tebow. You got to love what he's going to offer to this organization. It's a guy who's going to come at least, at minimum, help build a winning culture. At minimum, help box <coughs> office. How many times are they going to tarp off the 300 section with Jackson DeVille? I'm getting tired of that. They want to <laughs> sell some damn tickets. And at worst, Acho, I, I got to come at you a little bit because the, I'm coming at myself when I come at you. Yes, sir. Yes, little sir. Brother. Yes, sir. When we first get in the league, how we make the team? Special teams. Yes, sir. You think Tim Tebow can't play special teams at bare minimum? Let me tell you why. You got an issue with Tim Tebow because your frustration is in your conflation. Your conflation is there are lack of opportunities for coaches and minorities. 
So then all of a sudden you see Tebow, who's not a minority, who's not a coach, and you want to bring that into that conversation. Let me remind you out of this. Tim Tebow, all of the hate, all of the issues with this is all circling around two words. And it's about it being racial and religified. Yeah, I said it, damn it. Tim Tebow. Religified a word. No, but it's going to work on this segment. (laughs) Okay, this is why it's racialized. Because Tim Tebow, my God, was the OG of getting blackballed, or in his case, whiteballed. Like, Tim Tebow was the first one, took a knee before Kaepernick, and all of a sudden wins a playoff game, and then kind of just disappears from the landscape. Oh, Tim Tebow, religified. People are like, oh, they don't want to talk about it. I know y'all don't want God in schools right now, but do y'all don't want God in the stadium? Y'all don't want Tim Tebow on your team when he can contribute? He will rig the math on any offense that he plays in. I'll tell you why. Because if Tim Tebow lines up in any formation where he's capable of catching a ball or throwing a ball, a defense has to be wary no. of that. No. That's just the no. way it's going to play. No. Urban Meyer, at minimum, mm. is going to make Tim Tebow mm. go down mm. on special teams like Acho mm. and I did. Mm. He's going to, at maximum, rig the math and make all defensive coordinators have to think twice about how you perform. Here's this. how he will rig the math. Ha. There are typically 11 players on a football field. If Tebow is on the field, there are 10. That is how he would rid the math. We're going is, here. I am convinced that at 46 years of age, you can long arm, speed to power, Tim Tebow back into the quarterback's lap. I am beyond convinced at just 30 years of age, I could backpedal, T-step, and break on Tim Tebow and pick six him if he tried to go out on a route. Oh. I am convinced. Oh, you Bucky are. Brooks, I don't even know how old you are, but God help Tim Tebow, the Lord most high, if he lines up in the slot like this, and Bucky Brooks is back there on him, glasses and all. Reading glasses, not visor. <laughs> Tim Tebow ain't changing no math. And it's no sight yes, to Tim. Yes, he is. It's no sight to Tim. I love Tim Tebow. When we were in Philly <laughs> together, we were, we were working out together because we were the same body types. So we did all the workout drills together. We were going to Bible study together. We were doing, like, Tim Tebow is a phenomenal, phenomenal human being. Yeah, a yeah. phenomenal human being. Let's make no indictment on Tim Tebow or his character. However... Tim Tebow ain't running down on those special teams. Why not? Why not? Bro, you got to have speed that's, that's, on special teams. Hey, you have to have... 4-7 is not uh, fast j- enough? 4-7 12 years ago. 4-9 right now. You ran 4-5 once upon a time. 4-6, but thank you. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate you. Tebow, no. Just no. You could beat Tim Tebow in a pass pro drill. I could cover Tim Tebow. Mm-hmm. Bucky could cover Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow does not have it. If you want to sell tickets, make him a mascot. Ooh. If you want to motivate the team, Ooh. make him a strength coach. Ooh. But you do not need to make him one of the oh. 90 players on the roster. I love Tim oh. Tebow. God, oh. me and you good too right now, so I don't got to worry about getting <laughs> struck down for talking about your own. But don't make him one of the 90. Come on. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a, a name. Logan Thomas. You may not know who Logan Thomas was. I know Logan. Logan Thomas was quarterback, a quarterback Virginia from, Tech. from Virginia Tech, yeah, yeah, yeah. drafted by Arizona. He was 6'6". You six. know, he's drafting in 2014. 6'6". Six, six. He, he, Six. He, he played quarterback. Six. Failed out. Failed out playing quarterback for the Cardinals. Disappeared for a couple of years. Boop, pops up in Buffalo 2017, playing no, tight end. Plays two years in Buffalo, a people. year in Detroit. They he is now with the Washington football team. He had 72 receptions. The former quarterback turned tight end, has found a way to catch the ball. And so now, here's my issue. Because I'm not saying that Tim Tebow is going to be a world beater at tight end. But here's what I will say. Tim Tebow is coming off the baseball field. In baseball, you have to catch. You have to have mm. hand-eye coordination mm. because he has Ooh, been able to catch in baseball. So he has a level of yeah, hand-eye are. coordination so that he's bad. able to do that. Yes, he's able to do oh, that. So oh, oh. What, we're, what we're giving him oh, the benefit of the doubt is he has a level this of hand-eye coordination. Lucky. He has some size. He has some adequate skills. Then we're going to give him an opportunity to go and participate in the training camp. Just like Brock Lesnar did for the Minnesota Vikings. Bucky. We take all oh. guys and put them on the Kill field Bucky. and do Facts. it. So this is not the first time Look. that we've some, seen someone come out of the blue oh. and make their way to training camp. Oh, Look. this is good. Let me see Bucky and Marcellus, please, because they both need to hear this word. 
If y'all want to get good with God, just tithe and give your <laughs> offerings. You don't need to come defend one of his most glorified saints. Oh just take extra goodness. communion next time y'all in the church. Y'all don't need to come up here lying on St. Tebow, uh, mm. St. Tebow Aquinas. Mm. Y'all don't need to do all that. Okay. If y'all want to get right with your maker, mm. just tithe and offering. I'm going to bring the collection plate. Mm. But all this blasphemy y'all mm. doing on Tebow mm. is not necessary. You can't find that in none of the books of the Bible. This ain't going to help you, Bucky. Oh, oh, this is going to help us a lot. And it's so funny, man, going back. You want to go holy book right oh. here. How the devil and the angels used to all be in the same place. Like we all on this one screen together. And then your devilish butt just took off Acho <laughs> in a direction we can't understand. Let me give you a name, Acho. Matt Jones. Who? Matt Jones. I played with Matt Jones. Hey, what position you played in college? Uh, quarterback. What you doing over here six, catching 65 passes? Six. Yeah, yeah. He was and, six. Hey, Height ain't gonna get you into the league if so. All the basketball players will be in the NFL. Don't give me just this height crotch here. Let me give you another name since I, I wanna hit you where it hurts. Sam Acho. Uh oh. Um, was I going on vacation and somebody brother got the plug? Somebody got the hookup and you against nepotism? Oh, really? <laughs> he like last he time I checked, your brother ain't been on what? TV for he no years here? and years. But he up Bro, in here really? like he looking like me. What did that do? <laughs> I'm your big brother. <laughs> what the hell are you doing when I ain't here? Tebow with me like that. All right, here's another thing I gotta say. And I shall always try to pull your heartstrings. What I do, but y'all gotta catch Acho. Flip the coin on him. If Somebody loses their roster spot, their opportunity. Oh, poor me, Acho, a bubble player who needs that rep, that rep, that opportunity. If that guy loses his chance and opportunity, Tim Tebow, guess what? You ain't good enough, brother. Nobody want to hear about your plight and your issues if Tim Tebow takes your job. At minimum, I say special teams, at minimum, Tim Tebow can play long snapper. And we all know long snappers ain't nothing but pseudo golfers. Show up to practice late, leave early, and throw the ball between your legs to his hands. That's it. All this hate against Tebow, you better check with your Lord because he ain't happy with it. <laughs> Coming up, you bring your brother up here again see what happens. Steph Curry dropped 46 points last night to secure the scoring title and the AC for Golden State. We'll tell you what Steph proved this season next on Speak for Yourself. Steph Curry's 46 points last night led to more than just a win over the Grizzlies. The victory secured, secured the eighth seed for the Golden State Warriors and earned Curry his second scoring title. The two-time MVP has the Warriors back in the playoffs after 15 and 50 season that saw them miss the bubble entirely last year. Mm. John Morant, who faced Steph Curry for the first time on the court last night, tweeted, MVP, no debate. And Steph's next opponent, LeBron James, weighed in with his thoughts. Take a listen. I don't know anything else. Uh, if you're looking for MVP, if, if Steph is not on Golden State's team, then, um, you know, what, 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 are, what are we looking at? Um, you know, and we get, we, get all, we get caught up in a record sometimes. We get caught up in, oh, okay, who's the, who has the best record? And, you know, instead of just saying who had the best season that year. Uh, and Steph has had, in my opinion, the, the best season uh, all year. Talk that talk, King mm -hmm. James. Joined by someone else who knows how to talk that talk, my guy, Slick Rick the Buker. Uh, but Marcellus, what did Steph Curry prove to you this season? Nothing. Hmm? Nothing. Um, and I... I I take really an issue with people who are saying he proved something this year, and I know that somebody up here is going to obviously say something to that regard. Okay, he affirmed his greatness, affirmed his greatness. Like, okay, we know how great you are, and you showed us once again you're great. But how is Steph Curry still in some type of proving ground? Like, prove Steph Curry, prove something? How did we think this season was going to play out? Now, I know I'm going to sound smart to only dumb people right now because this was pretty obvious. No Klay Thompson, Mr. Triple Single, and Draymond Green with his lowest output of seven points per game this year. And Andrew Wiggins is your second leading scorer with his monotone self. And he gave you the least production that he's had in the last three years. And what do you think Steph Curry was going to do? He was going to go out there and light it up and this team is going to struggle to make the playoffs and be exactly where they are. So when I hear proven, I take it as a slight. This is a two-time MVP. And people are like, yeah, he proved something mm -hmm. to me. He's already been great. He was top five before we even got into this conversation. Oh, y'all got derailed. He broke his wrist. 
That's just hand up. People was like, oh, he can't golf anymore. What, do you think he can't play basketball anymore? As soon as he got healthy, he showed you who he was. The Steph Curry of old is still the Steph Curry that's great. Steph Curry proved he's the most underrated player in NBA history. Okay, I'll take that. Very simply, when you talk about the players who have multiple scoring titles, multiple NBA championships, and multiple MVPs, the list is Michael Jordan, Wilt Chamberlain, Kareem, and Steph. How did Steph Curry prove that he is the most underrated player in NBA history? Because if you were to poll 100 people and ask them who is the greatest basketball player to ever play the game, some old head would say Wilt Chamberlain. Some not as old head would say Kareem, more deserving. And the majority of people would say Michael Jordan. But nobody would ever fix their lips to even put Steph Curry typically in a top 10 conversation. Look at the rankings of the greatest basketball players of all time. You do not see Steph Curry in a top 10 conversation. But Steph Curry, the only player with Michael Jordan to win a scoring title at 33 and older? Steph Curry, a unanimous MVP? The only player to win a unanimous MVP? Steph Curry doing this at this age, plus what he has already done and already accounted for? I think this season, if he proved nothing else, Steph Curry proved that he is the most underrated player to ever dribble a basketball. Mm. Okay, before I get to all of the things that he proved and did not prove, I have to take care of this business because, E, you keep trotting this out. What I do? That the being the only unanimous MVP selection somehow suggests that he's the only guy that was ever worthy of being a unanimous Ooh, gotta, MVP oh, selection. Gotta, ooh, I can't be my gotta, brother's gotta. keepers, all of my <laughs> other media members who decided that Shaquille O'Neal one year didn't deserve it or Kobe didn't deserve it. I can't take that un unanimity, if I can say that, and suggest that that somehow elevates him above some of these other players. This is what he demonstrated. This is what he proved this year. He proved, one, that nice guys don't have to finish last. Mm -hmm. They may not finish first, and he didn't this year, but they don't have to finish last. Mm -hmm. He also proved that you don't have to be a hard ass mm -hmm. in order to inspire or lead. He demonstrated that he's not only one of the greatest or, or the greatest all-time shooters in the game, but that he's the greatest all-time contested shot maker mm. of all time because just about every shot he took this year was contested. But the problem that you have in having this conversation with me is that I've been watching the league very closely for a long time. And so while I am excited, thrilled, I admire the hell out of what Steph Curry did with this crew this year. I was around in 2011 when Derrick Rose took a team that wasn't much more talented than this one mm. all the way to the Eastern Conference Finals. I was around when Carmelo Anthony won the 2013 scoring title and took the New York Knicks to the second round with a team not that much better than this one. So while I appreciate and love what Steph Curry has done, and there's nobody I'd rather watch playing the game. When I put what he's done in context, he has a team that is in the eighth seed. We don't even know if they're actually going to make the playoffs because they still have to go through the play-in tournament in order to get there. And I, I look at what he has around him. I can appreciate it. I can applaud. But I am not going to go to the heights that you just did, E, where it's this season elevates him into the top five or ten all time. I just, there's still an eighth seed. There's still only a couple games over 500. What are we talking about? I thought I, I said it. I didn't say that Steph Curry was one of the top five or top ten all time. I said uh, he is the most underrated player uh, of all time. Slick, uh, if I were to blind and resume then, you. And then you said we never talked to him, talk about him being in the top Slick, five or top uh, ten. Slick, uh, if, if I were to blind resume you and I were to say this, yep. this player is the only player to win a unanimous MVP during the era of Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, Tim Duncan. And there, you know, if I were to tell you, Slick, this player had a scoring title after the age of 33. Only Michael Jordan did so. If I were to tell you, Slick, this player was on a list with Wilt Chamberlain, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and Michael Jordan as the only players with multiple scoring titles, multiple MVPs, and multiple championships, you'd be like, man, 
probably a, I don't know, top eight, top 10, top 12 type of player. Who is he? Then I tell you, oh, it's Steph Curry. Oh, just Steph? That's what we do. Oh, just that guy? Oh, mm. just, just Steph? You're the, you're the oldest scoring champion since then? Oh, just Steph? Like, Slick, you are mm. sleeping. E, I'll mm. give you this. You're Ooh. sleeping on the fact, Slick, e, I'll that give he you is this. a unanimous MVP when LeBron was there, and D. Wade was there, and Kobe was there, and Kawhi was there, and Duncan was there, and D. Rose was there, and Chris Paul was there, and Harden was there, and uh, Kevin Durant was there, and Westbrook was there. Unanimous, Slick. <laughs> yeah. Put you're now, to, you're, you're now trying to trigger me by using that unanimous <laughs> time no. after time. Don't. Don't do that. Look, I will give you that we have never fully appreciated what Steph Curry has accomplished okay, in that. his career and the intangibles that he brings that go above and beyond what that dude in a 6'3", 190-pound body can do. What, it, it is remarkable what he's accomplished. But don't take what we've seen this season, what has happened in this season and say that this somehow elevates him to a new place or that this is a reflection of why we haven't fully appreciated him. As Marcellus said, he's been this and he's been better than this. I fully reject this idea that this is the best we've seen of, of Steph Curry. And by the way, the guy who just got knocked out by this, by Steph, is going to say he's undoubtedly the MVP. And the guy who's got to face him next is saying he's undoubtedly the MVP. Doesn't make him the MVP. It makes it convenient that those two guys <laughs> would try to add a little luster to what's going on with them by saying he's the MVP. Exactly. Make him a greater Goliath so they can go out there and slay him and then say, oh, what have we done? I don't know when in sports being underrated is even a good thing. Maybe day one when they don't know who you are. Blank canvas time. But when you're 33 years old and you've been in the league this damn long and this great and they're still saying that you are underrated. I push back on that because mm. I believe in the wisdom of the crowd. Just like when you go to Vegas, you better believe in the house. The house knows how to balance <laughs> this thing on out. Like, there's some genius in that how people properly rate. So I don't even buy into what Acho is saying because Steph Curry, to me, is not top 10. Acho couldn't even fix his lips to say he was top 10 despite saying that no one else can fix their lips to say he was top 10. He's amazing. He's amazing this year. He's been amazing for many of years. But to act like this year trampolined him into a new stratosphere, why? Because he had less around him? Like, all this meant was more shots for you. What this meant was more contested shots. Well, what this also meant is you answered the bell. But Steph Curry's always answered the bell. The only time that you can even look at Steph Curry and say he didn't answer the bell was early in his career because of injuries with the ankles or the realization that I'm playing with a seven foot guy that can shoot as well as I can named Kevin Durant. Outside of that, Steph Curry, is, Steph Curry has always carried this team and has always been this great. This is what I think Steph Curry proved, and I think he proved it to me overtly and to you all subliminally. What? If at 33 slick, Steph Curry can put up 32 points a game, then that at least should challenge you and Marcellus's previous theories should it be Marcel I? Is plural Marcel Marcel? <laughs> that you. should challenge you and Marcel I's <laughs> previous theory that Steph Curry did not relent and that did not relinquish, rather, his powers when Kevin Durant came over. Don't do this. We I'm doing it. Seconds. No, I'm doing it. 50 seconds. Because if at 33, we don't have time for another if at segment. 33, don't do that. you can be the scoring champion. Imagine what he could have done at 29. Yeah. If at 33, you could make the most contested shots a game. No Imagine reason. what he could have done at 28. Ugh. I'm trying to tell y'all, and I've been trying to tell y'all, Steph Curry proved in this previous season that he actually has always been that good. <laughs> But he relinquished his ability, and unfortunately, you and Marcellus okay. never know this. Do you want but us I to did. like him or hate him? Here's a dot. Him. What do you want? And I'm here's a dot. Here's two dots. You can't connect these two dots, Acho. <laughs> Sorry. They're just too hey, far apart. Two dots scientifically can always be connected. That's facts. Uh, uh, you should know that. Vortex or some crazy like that. Come on, Ivy League. Coming up, <laughs> Jalen Hurts is looking impressive in his command of the Eagles offense, uh. according to his new head coach. We'll figure out how seriously we should take Eagles this season. Next, speak for yourself. Saturday, MLB is back on Fox, headlined by an interleague showdown between the Red Sox and Phillies. Or it's two of the greatest rivalries in baseball, the Dodgers take on the Giants and the Cubs face the Cardinals. 
Saturday, 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific, only on Fox and the Fox Sports app. Check local listings for the game in your area. Area! New Eagles head coach Nick Sirianni has yet to name Jalen Hurts the starter or have him on the field for an official team practice. Heisman winner Devontae Smith, Eagles 10th overall pick, did see his first NFL practice time as rookie mini camp got underway. While Hurts, his former Alabama teammate, has impressed his new head coach with his ability to pick up the offense remotely. Take a listen. Jalen's done a heck of a job learning the offense. He's impressive in there. Um, he's really got a good control of it. Jalen's just done a good job of, of, of taking the, the plays that have been taught to him, and he, he can really rattle off exactly what he's supposed to do on every single play. And it'll be, it'll be exciting to get on the field with him and, uh, and see him do it physically. Okay. Bucky Brooks is back with us, but I'm coming to you, Acho. How serious should we take the Eagles this season? Not. Like as serious as somebody when they say it's gonna be cold in Cali. Like, like are we in the <laughs> East Coast? What you mean? You just don't take them seriously. I'll be real with y'all. And, and Eagles fans, I love y'all, so I'm gonna tell y'all what others might not. Um, mm. Prepare for the next few years, right? This ain't the year. This just ain't it. Yeah, it's just a, it's not gonna happen for what? us this year. What? Here's why I say that. What has Nick Sirianni shown us, even in off-season pressers, that he can galvanize men? Oh. What has he shown us that he can be a fearless leader? I've been in those locker rooms at, at the facility, at the practice stadium, one Nova Care way. I've, I've stood before coaches who have at least galvanized for a period. Nick Sirianni playing rock, paper, scissors with recruits. <laughs> Nick Sirianni uh, not being able to finish a sentence in his opening presser. I don't know what he's shown us. That's first thing. Second thing. What has Jalen Hurts truly shown us to say that we should take them seriously? Jalen Hurts has shown us flashes and dashes, but remember, he was still one and three as a starter, one and two if you don't even want to count that last game. Defensive coordinator, what is Jonathan Gannon? Shown anybody. Gannon. Jonathan back. Gannon shown anybody. Step Jonathan back. Gannon was the Indianapolis Colts cornerback coach. Can I see Bucky Brooks? He was the Indianapolis Colts cornerback coach. Bucky, you know this better than anybody. Who on the defense probably knows the least about defense at any given time? <laughs> a uh, cornerback. Oh, Either a cornerback oh, or a defensive oh, end. No, the tackles. Oh, it's not yeah, fat boys in the middle. It's not the no, safeties. They know out. a ton. Don't call me out. It's not the linebackers. They, they know a ton. God, they don't know. You, you, can, you, can, God, maybe, know. you can maybe say the no. tackles. But you could also say the corners, because what do the corners got to know? Am I in cat coverage? That's a bet. Am I in cloud coverage? That's cover two? That's a bet. Am I playing a deep third? Corners have no care about run fits. Why am I bringing this up? Because Jonathan Gannon is a 38-year-old defensive backs coach who didn't play college football, had an unfortunate accident and injury. So Jonathan Gannon isn't even oozing out full competent defensive pictures. Not to say you can't learn it, but it's to say he's always seen the game based upon his coaching lineage from a limited point of view. Ask anybody who's played the game of football what I mean. A cornerback just doesn't have to care about run fits because it ain't got nothing to do with them. With all of that being said, I don't trust the Eagles head coach. I can't yet trust the Eagles quarterback. I think I will in due time, but I can't yet. And I don't trust the Eagles defensive coordinator. So why am I taking him seriously? Damn. Fires. Wow, man. Like, I chose not real positive today. I mean, I think Guzman <laughs> talked to you and inspired you again to get him going. Here's what I'll say about taking the Eagles seriously. I think you have to take them seriously because it is a division. Remember, this is a division last year where we saw the New York Giants fighting for a playoff position at the end of the year, and we didn't think they didn't have talent. We worried about the coaching and everything. And so just because of that, we have to consider the Eagles a viable contender within that division, even though I believe the Cowboys are going to run away with it. I've talked about it ad nauseum. We understand why. But for Jalen Hurts, I think it's a good thing what Nick Sirianni said about him. The fact that he was able to make, master the playbook virtually. Because before you can play well, you got to know what to do and you got to know how to do it. That gives him a chance. Jalen Hurts is a hard worker. He's an extremely productive player when he's been on the field. The first player to ever have 500 passing yards mm. and over 150 rushing yards in his first two starts. So it's a solid building block. They go bring his former number one receiver, Devontae Smith. He comes over. Hopefully they get more production from Jalen Rager. And this offense is able to score points. 
with Miles Sanders in the backfield. Defensively, yes, there's a concern. You can talk about Gannon maybe not knowing anything because he's been with corners. Well, who's to say that he doesn't understand the entire picture? Thanks. He can't put this team together. I think you're being very pessimistic because you have – Sad feelings because they got rid of your beloved Carson Wentz. Say and it. you still have that jersey that you wear at night. That's why. Say it. Look, it's a new era. Fly, Eagles, fly. I think the Eagles are going to be much better than you anticipate this season. Thank you. Uh, how serious should you take them? Very serious because you can't take this division seriously. So they're going to be contenders in this division just because it was a seven-win division. That was easy. Layup. Um, I'm not listening to Acho and his self-hate. Uh, it, it's starting. The list is growing. We got Dallas. He doesn't love anything Dallas because he's from Dallas. Now the Eagles because they took his took a chance on him like five, six, seven, eighteen <laughs> times, and now he's upset at them as well because everybody's gone. Let's speak about everybody that's gone. Jalen Hurts took over a franchise from a $128 million franchise quarterback who left this franchise for dead. And he put it at least on life support, a glimmer of hope. There is some life left in this Eagles team and roster. So you got to respect them. But this is the moment of truth that I want Acho to go back to. Acho, look at the camera right now with me, big dog. I'm going to compare Jalen Hurts' first three starts to... A unanimous MVP's first three starts in Lamar Jackson. Who had the highest passing yards per game of those first three? Oh, you know who it is. Uh, touchdown to interception ratio? Oh, you know who it is. Passer rate? Oh, you know who it is. Yards per carry? Oh, you know who it is. At that moment in time, I wonder what Acho was saying. He wasn't on the show with me. Talking about, well, I don't know about Lamar Jackson. And what did Lamar Jackson do from that point forward? Same thing can happen with Jalen Hurts because he has resuscitated your Philadelphia Eagles. Rampart, Rampart. Coming up, Kyrie hey. Irving says that basketball isn't the most important thing to him right now. Hmm. We'll react to that next Don't Speak for Yourself. Kyrie Irving and the Nets were spectacular last night, giving fans and viewers one of the plays of the year. Ah, Lee Blake Griffin behind us, back off the backboard, Kevin Durant, just Sick. my goodness, my goodness, my goodness. Sick. Now, after the game, Kyrie didn't want to talk about that play or the Nets win in their season finale. Kyrie had other things on his mind. Y'all take a listen. You know, I'm not going to lie to you guys. A lot of stuff is going on in this world, and uh, basketball is just not the most important thing to me right now. There's a lot of stuff going on overseas. All my people are still in bondage all across the world, and there's a lot of dehumanization going on. So, you know, I apologize if I'm not going to be focused on y'all questions. You know, it's just too much going on in the world for me to just be talking about basketball. Like, I focus on this 24-7 most of the time, but it's just too much going on in this world not to address. So, Sel, what mm. is your reaction to Kyrie Irving saying basketball is not the most important thing right now? Man, uh, I'm torn uh, because it's interesting. He's never going to think basketball is the most important thing if he consumes himself in world affairs. Like, just think about it. No matter where you go in this world, what's happening there won't be as important as some of the more traumatic things that are happening across this world. Mm -hmm. Also, you got to balance that out with the greatest ability that all athletes possess, which is the ability to compartmentalize. What does that ability allow you to do in this moment? Because Kyrie Irving doesn't seem affected on the court when he's out there by the world's affairs. It gives him the opportunity to allow his heart to bleed for many things, but let his mind be focused on the task at hand that his body is being asked to perform. So I respect that. I am really on the fence on this one because I look at him, I'm like, damn, Kyrie. Don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. And what's a good story is your team right now, you playing this year, and people coming out left and right saying you're the most skilled basketball player potentially ever. But damn, what a downy, what a downer. What a bad one in this situation to kind of put. Reminds me of like, you ever seen me in society? Of course not. Um, Sharif. Uh, Sharif always sitting on the cooler. They at the graduation party, having a good time, trying to have a beer. He's sitting on the cooler. Y'all shouldn't be drinking this poison. Like, it's always somebody just going to inject a little too much reality into a good time. That's, that's a good point, man. I'm with you. I'm yeah. torn. I mean, obviously, there are always going to be more important things going on in your life than your job, unless your job dictates life and death. Okay. Unless your, your occupation inherently has to do with life and death, i.e. a doctor, i.e. somebody, a medical worker, a psychology worker, something you. in that field, there are always going to be things in life that are far more important 
than your job, particularly if your job is playing a game, <laughs> which basketball is. But to Sal's point, you got to be able to compartmentalize, number one. And two, I'm re reminiscent of the quote, be where your feet are. Ah, Love I'm reminiscent you. of the quote, Love be you. where your feet are. So yeah. what that means is if my feet are sitting at this speak for yourself desk, then my mind should be at this speak for yourself show. Mm -hmm. Kyrie, if your feet are on the basketball court dribbling the basketball, then be where your feet are. Now, once you get to the podium, I'm torn, right? That's a gray space. Right. You're not necessarily on the court anymore. You're not necessarily in a parking lot. That's kind of a gray space. And if you want to, at that point in time, use your voice, use your platforms for the greater issues going on in our world, then by all means do so. But I would again, like Marcellus, you just kind of got to caution Kyrie. Just because you inundate yourself with information does not necessarily mean it is beneficial for you. Mm. And Kyrie is kind of inundating himself with so much of what is going on in the world that there can come a point where it can be detrimental to his health. Remember, Kyrie Irving missed about 10 games this year for reasons we still don't know. Right. Now, he averaged 50, 40, and 90, one of only nine players in the history of the NBA game to do so. 90% from the free throw line, 50% from the field, 40% from three. So he is amazing, but he's amazing when he chooses to play the game. Mm. And the Nets are pay paying him to always choose to play the game, not just be available when he is. Yeah, I mean, if you try to take this world all the way and internalize all of it, you're taking in too much water, brother. Sooner or later, that boat's going to sink in that situation. I, I leave it with this. Old school focus used to be to focus in on one dot and say, I eat, sleep, consume all that. And we're out of that mindset now. We're in new school focus, which means there's a million dots on the wall. I understand, Kyrie, there are a million concerns on the wall. But in new school focus, you got to know which dots to prioritize and which one you can have true impact on. Coming up, the hottest topic during commercial breaks on Let's this go. show. Does DK Metcalf's 10.37 high school 100-meter time have defenders Watch your mouth. <laughs> Watch your mouth. We'll answer that. Where DK at? Next, uh, speak for yourself. DK Metcalf ran a 10.37 in his first competitive race since high school. Exactly as I predicted, I told you. NFL analyst Bucky Brooks wrote that although his 1037 second time in the 100 meters ranked 15th out of 17 competitors in an event, Metcalf showing as a six foot four, 230 pounder, undoubtedly made defensive coaches and defensive backs cringe. Mm -hmm. So, Acho, you think NFL defenders are scared after seeing DK Metcalf run a high school time? Are they more scared? Yes. Um, because DK Metcalf had already intimidated defensive backs, but after blazing down the track in a 10:37, blazing, which is, blazing, <laughs> which is incredible, whether you are a NFL athlete or actually even an Olympic sprinter, I'll show you all exactly why. In your first race, oh, you're exactly your scared. First race. Marcellus Wiley, one of the greatest American sprinters, albeit he has um, been suspended for years at a time for performance-enhancing oh, drugs. Don't you Justin do it. Gatlin, don't do it. Um, he's one of the greatest American sprinters of our time. Even Justin Gatlin opened the season this year to 10.24. Even Justin Gatlin. Is that a 37? The fastest uh -huh. American sprinter of our time. He's tuning he up. He still opened the season at a 10.24. Mm -hmm. And Justin Gatlin continually runs under a 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. Just a few years ago, he opened the season at a 10.37. Mm -hmm. And Justin Gatlin continually runs under 10 seconds. Because in your first race of the season, even if you're an Olympian, you still at a 10.2 and a 10.3. DK Metcalf was his first race of his adult life. All right. And he ran a 10.37. <laughs> now, further than that, Marcellus, because you really know track. I really least, know I, track. I believe you to really know track. You should know some other names like Mike Rogers. Now, Mike yeah, Rogers, yeah. he makes just about relay every team. team. He makes every relay team yep. since 2012. He's Facts. literally made every U.S. relay yep. team. Beast. This year, he's run slower than 10.37 twice. Last year, he ran slower than 10.37 three times. The year before, he ran slower than 10.37 twice. So, Marcellus Wiley. I'm ready. If you can run 10.37 as an Olympian mm. in your first race of the season, if DK Metcalf runs 10.37 in his first race of his adult life, that is incredibly mm. impressive. Incredibly. Okay, uh, one thing, let me just start by saying this. You're a national DK, record holder? Uh, well, I am a national record holder in track and field. You ain't. Uh, <laughs> I actually have won. I've run in Eugene, Oregon, and did that. Gold medal. Okay. Let me get all of my qualifications out the way. <laughs> he made us date our fantasy. 
and let us down. See, our fantasy was DK Metcalf was fast for football and fast, fast because he could run track too. Mm -hmm. But we realized after seeing him get dead last, not even in the finals, in the race before everybody got out the parking lot to get there. You were the only one in attendance. That's why your video did 4 million views. It was, the broadcast didn't even show it live. He got last. And you think that's a scary visual to football players? Let me remind you what a football player mindset and ego is. Two times top 50 player in the NFL. You looking at him right now. You think I'm scared of some dude getting last and it wasn't even the finals? Hell no. Let me give you something about track that's different. There's an absolute and there's a relative. In track, running is about your time, but racing is about your place. This, boo, this dude got smoked in both categories. He ran a 10:37. Yes, sir. That's 228th in the world this year. Think that's scary? Okay, let's go here. 21 high schoolers have run faster than DK Metcalf this year. What are you talking about? I'm not even dissing him. He should have just let it be with him running down Buda Baker. And then in my mind, as a defender, I'm like, yo, this dude fast, fast. But once you go out there and get last, last, then I'm not respecting you the same anymore. No, brother. I'm about to get on you. I don't say, I ain't say the word, but you knew what was coming. <laughs> so, yeah. you are one of the most talented men on TV. Aww. I watch a lot of sports television on a lot of networks, and I can safely say you're one of the most talented people on TV. What I can also safely say is this. You were not very good your first day. I went back through the archives. Yeah! I don't have them pulled up. Oh, damn. But I went back through the archives, and I saw, man, to where Marcellus is now, huh? from where he was then, he was terrible. Oh, terrible. So Charles what Barker that tells me is, terrible. Sal, if on your first day, oh, okay. you weren't the man you are now, but you've grown and matured oh. and practiced and honed in on your abilities yeah. to be one of the best. Okay. Now, DK on his first day has run faster this season what? than an Olympian who has made six consecutive Olympic teams and mm. Mike Rogers. Mm -mm. Six consecutive mm -mm. I'm not Olympic you to teams. I'm not I, you you got to let me on the hook. Oh. I will stay on the hook and win this argument. Oh, I'm ready? on the hook winning. You ready? Let's go. Okay, we know this is a pandemic affected last year, 2020. Let's go back to 2019 full season. 401st in the world that time would have been. You think you scared somebody being 401st? Try to show up in the club and say, hey, girl, what's your name? She's like, oh, what place are you in the world? 401. <laughs> hey, she gonna look at your 401k and be like, that's about it, <laughs> your old ass. Oh, look, somebody up here, and I thought it was gonna be us, but it's just me, has to protect tracks. The integrity of the purest sport. That's what I'm doing. No, 1037 is slow at the pro level. I don't give it, look, Acho, let me give it to you like this. Two ways. One, if you and I get into a fight and I whoop you down, mm -hmm. which I don't know if I could. I don't think so. But if I did, and then I go fight Floyd Mayweather, and I don't do Jack, I'm not a good fighter. I just beat up Acho. Here's another example. Okay. This is my last one. You know why Lamar Jackson didn't run at the Combines? Because he didn't want to date the fantasy. DK, you're not supposed to run when they assume you faster than all outdoors. But you went out there and answered the question. Can you ain't that fast. We agree to this. What? 1037 is not fast, no. But 1037, what? but, but 1037 as an opener, knowing what other Olympians have opened at, is a competent enough time to let you believe he could run fast. No, fast. no, you know in track of all sports, mentally fatigued, you plateau, and a lot of guys run their PRs when they're younger. Coming up, Tom Brady and Robert Kraft. I had to win that one. Thank you. <laughs> Both say that they're looking forward to Brady's return to New England in week four. We'll tell you who we believe next. Don't speak for yourself. Our pals at TMZ Sports ran up on Robert Kraft in Beverly Hills. Oh. Uh, over the weekend <laughs> and asked the Patriots owner about one of the most exciting matchups in the NFL this offseason. Tom Brady returning to New England as a Buccaneer at that. Now, Kraft claimed he's, quote, excited to have him. So, Marcellus, are yes. you buying that Robert Kraft is excited for Brady's return? Am I buying that Bob Kraft from CU, Columbia University, is excited? Absolutely. He has no beef with Tom Brady. Matter of fact, nothing but love for Tom Brady. Both Belichick and Tom Brady will be on the Wall of Fame. And Bob Kraft's like, I'm eating off of both of y'all, so of course I'm going to love this. All right, so what about you? Head now, yes or no? All right, Fox Dead Live <laughs> is next. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah.